Okay, guys, sorry about that. Um, so let's let's go back here for effective nuclear charge. So as scientists, we have come up with a way to calculate effective um, nuclear charge. And we're going to symbolize nuclear effective nuclear charge as Z-E-F-F. And um, that EFF in subscript is just representing that it's effective nuclear charge. So the effective nuclear charge can be found by taking Z minus S. Well, what does Z mean? What does S mean? Z represents atomic number. So that would just be my number of protons that I have there. And S is, is considered to be a screening constant. Your screening constant is um, your core electrons. So screening constant equals core electrons. So Z is number of protons or atomic number and S are your core electrons. So let's like do an example here. Let's say that we wanted to know what the effective nuclear charge of sodium would be. If I wrote the electron configuration for sodium, I know that sodium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, right? And I know if I wanted to write that in noble gas configuration, then that would be um, neon in brackets and then 3s1. So the core electrons would be all of my electrons up until neon, right? So that would be my um, screening constant. Those would be those core electrons. So I would have 10 of them. So my S, my screening constant, would be 10. I know that sodium, which I want to know the atomic number, sodium's atomic number is 11. It has 11 protons, so Z would be 11. So to find the effective nuclear charge, I would take 11, the atomic number, which we said would be Z minus S, which are the core electrons. So that would be all of the electrons that would... Um, be above or before that third energy level for sodium, before that energy level that sodium is on. So that would be all of my electrons up to neon, which would be 10, 10 electrons. So I would take 11 minus 10, and that would give me a positive one. So the effective nuclear charge for sodium would be um, a positive one, according to our equation here. Now, the effective nuclear charge acting on an electron in an atom is smaller than the actual nuclear charge. And that's because the effective nuclear charge takes into account the electron repulsions or all of the electrons repelling one another in the atom. Um, in many electron atoms, we know that the inner electrons are partially screening or shielding the view of those outermost electrons um, attraction to the nucleus. So because I have other electrons in the way, we have shielding or we have some screening there. And we have to take into account that screening constant. So the reason that we um, can't just say that nuclear charge would be number of protons because we, we pretty much said that last year. We thought of nuclear charge as just being those um, just thinking about it in terms of number of protons. But now we want to include that also I have to account for some shielding or for some electron repulsion. Okay, so let's look at our next slide. Um, in terms of a trend for effective nuclear charge, nuclear charge is going to increase from left to right across any period of the periodic table. So we did sodium. We said that sodium would have an effective nuclear charge of one. Well, let's do the next element um, next to sodium, which would be magnesium. So magnesium has a um, atomic number of 12, which would mean that it would have 12 protons. So Z would equal 12. And then I want to think about its shielding or screening constant. So what are its core electrons? Well, if I think about the core again as being like the, in that noble gas configuration, that would be that noble gas. Um, that would also be neon in case of mag magnesium. So that would mean that I would have 10 electrons for my screening constant. So to find the effective nuclear charge, I would take atomic number minus that screening constant. So I would take 12 minus 10. That would give me a positive 2. So that means that magnesium would have a positive 2. If I did the same thing for aluminum, aluminum has 13 um, 
protons, so its atomic number is 13. Same screening constant, which would be 10, so 13 minus 10 would give me a positive 3 effective nuclear charge. So we're increasing as we're moving from left to right on the periodic table. And that's just because as we're moving across the periodic table, the, the amount of um, shielding on that energy level stays the same. So that amount of, of shielding on that particular energy level is, is the same. The only thing that is increasing now is the number of protons. So because the core electrons are staying the same, it's not shielding any differently. Um, but because the number of protons is increasing, my effective nuclear charge is going to increase from left to right. Now remember as well that we talked about last year, in terms of nuclear charge, um, if we have more protons that are, if we have more protons in the nucleus and we're thinking about the same energy level, that nucleus, as it's increasing in protons, is going to grab a hold of those electrons and pull them in um, more tightly. So nuclear charge does a really good job, as it increases from left to right, does a really good job of pulling that electron cloud kind of closer in to the nucleus. It's going to pull those electrons in tighter. Um, now, when we go down a column, so as we go across a period or a row, we know nuclear charge increases. As we go down a column, the effective nuclear charge um, changes far less than it would across a period. And that's because um, as we go down the column, we're, we're gaining more and more energy levels. So the core electron cloud is less able to screen the valence electrons necessarily from nuclear charge. So because we're adding more and more energy levels, that attraction is becoming weaker and weaker. So nuclear charge just really isn't necessarily as, as strong. Um, so just because we're adding more shielding and we're adding more energy levels, our, our nuclear charge just isn't going to be as effective as we go down a column. Okay, so in terms of um, what is the size of an atom? So let's we're going to start off um, talking about atomic radii trend. We did talk about this one last year. So how do we measure the how do we measure the um, distance from the outer edge of an electron cloud to the nucleus? Well, we can't do it for one atom because we don't know where the definite edge of the electron cloud is for an atom. Because remember, we know that we have a 90% chance of finding an electron in the electron cloud, but that still gives us a 10% chance of finding an electron maybe outside of that cloud because we don't have a definite edge or a definite end of that electron cloud. So what we've done instead is we have done... Um, we have bonded two similar, or two identical atoms together. And by bonding them, their electron clouds are going to overlap a little bit. So we'll have an overlap of these electron clouds. And we can find the distance between the two nuclei of these two atoms. And then we can cut that distance in half. And that distance that we cut in half, we can say that is the atomic radii for one atom. Is that a perfect method? No. But is it the best method that we have? Yes. So may not may not be the best because we have the overlap of those two um, electron clouds of those atoms, but it's, it's the best thing that we have right now, so it's good enough. Um, now in terms of atomic size. So kind of before we um, get to the next slide, I just want to talk in general about a trend then. So as we go down a column for atomic radii, remember as we go down columns, we're adding energy levels. So as we add energy levels, it's really like we're adding more space for those electrons um, to be moving around. We're adding more orbitals, more shapes there. And if we're adding more, more space, more shapes, then it should make sense that as we go down a column, atomic radii should do what? Should it increase or should it decrease if I'm adding more and more energy levels? It should increase, right? Because if I'm adding more energy levels, it means I'm adding more space. I'm adding more volume to that atom, so it would get bigger. But as I go across a row or as I go across a period, what would happen to atomic radii? What would happen to the size of the atom? 
In that case, we should say that it should decrease. And it should decrease because of the that, that last thing that we just talked about, which is the effective nuclear charge. Now, if we are moving across a row, energy level's not changing, right? Because the energy level would be staying the same. If I was in um, the third energy level, so I'm in 3s, 3p, if I'm thinking about those elements in that row, the energy level's not changing because energy level's just staying three there. Um, shielding is going to stay the same because I'm not, um, my core electrons are staying the same. So... That means the only thing that could be affecting it would be nuclear charge. And I know that as we're moving across, we're increasing the number of protons in the nucleus as we're moving across there. So as I'm increasing the number of protons, that nucleus can pull those electrons in more tightly. So then that's making the size of the atom, it's, it's, it would be hugging those electrons more tightly so the atomic radii is going to get smaller. My atomic size is going to get smaller. And I want to think about this. The noble gases have a full octet. They have all of their valence electrons. So they are the smallest because those nuclei of the noble gases are wanting to hold on to their electrons so tightly. They don't want to give up their electrons at all because they are happy, they are stable, they have a full octet. So it should make sense then that their atomic radii or their atomic size should be the smallest because they have so much coulombic attraction between their electrons and their nucleus that they're hugging those electrons or they're pulling those electrons in super tight. And it's because of that effective nuclear charge. Okay, so we're going to stop here for class today. Um, you have some class time to start working on. I would start working on where it says the chapter 6, even though this is, even though the last, um, I think it's chapter 6. Maybe so. Yeah, maybe it is right. I would start working on the chapter six questions first. Um, the ones that dealt with the electron configurations, things like that with the multiple choice before you start on the chapter seven ones because we want to get through more of this chapter seven um, PowerPoint slides before we start doing those multiple choice questions. So remember that you're going to have a blog video that will be posted on Saturday morning. So check for that. And we'll just continue moving on with chapter 7. I'll post the answers to the multiple choice questions also on Saturday. And if you have questions, just uh, shoot me an email. And I will um, see you guys on the video on Saturday. But see you on Monday for sure. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And I will see you Monday. Bye, guys.